right. All right. So All right, I broke you guys out into rooms. Um, oh wait, no, I don't want two people per room. Hold on, I'm gonna start over, hold on. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't want three rooms of two. I wanted two rooms for three, hold on. Let's try this again. More breakout rooms. Um, delete room, yes, now recreate, Six I wanted two rooms, there we go, okay, so there you go, huh? So the readings were chapter six from each text, right? Okay. Were they? Um, you said since we didn't go over them on Thursday before or on Tuesday before the midterm that we were going to talk about them today. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. okay. That's fine. Lucy, please stop. Hey, Brian, are you able to join the um the group? Alana, you're in with Matt. And Ryan, I'm not sure where Ryan is. Hopefully he'll join you guys shortly. I have to start recording again. Okay, so at the very beginning, there's this part where they talk about presidential versus parliamentary systems. Did you guys 
Is that where they're talking about how presidential democracies are more likely to co collapse than non-democracies? Right, right. So why do they say that that is? Because presidential democracies are more rigid and less accommodating. Right, okay. So um, especially uh, when you're talking about, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, situations like this, right? So they, uh, you're concentrating all of the power um, in the executive, right? Um, and uh, so more uh, different groups end up becoming um, sort of left out of the decision-making process, right? So it was Matthew's comment that sort of made me remember that that was, <laughs> right, um, at the beginning of this chapter, right? So what he was talking about in relation to like cabinet positions or minister positions or whatever, right? Um, so uh, it ends up in, it can anyway, when there um, is not uh, a balance of power or the balance of power is not maintained, right? A presidential system is more likely to backslide, okay, away from democracy than a parliamentary system is, okay, because of having that one person in power in the form of the president. In parliamentary systems, right, yes, you have a prime minister and you will have a, this sort of figurehead head of state, right, but ultimately, it, the um, parliament has power, um, uh, more power than in a presidential system to remove the PM. So there's more power, um, the PM is more accountable to the parliament, okay, than a president is in a presidential system, okay? Um, and uh, so uh, in that way, that's why they say that, um, uh, you know, there can be situations where there's less accountability um, and more and more power gets invested into the executive, right? And that can be very dangerous, right? And that ultimately parliamentary systems are better for democracy in the long run, okay? Um, so anyway, let's see. Um, so uh, going back to what Matt was talking about, about the dissolution of the Duma and how fresh elections have to happen if the uh, prime minister is continuously rejected, mm -hmm. uh, how likely are those uh, members just likely to run again and be not and be uh, voted in? Um, you mean the Duma people, like yeah. the Duma ministers, right? Has, has it, it, I mean, has it happened? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, people run again and they... You know, um, but then sometimes some of those people run again and then they get, they don't go. I mean, they don't get elected, right? So it just depends on the particular people, um, you know, the particular circumstances, uh, you know, it, it just, it just depends, you know, but oftentimes they are put back in um, if they're particularly popular or something like this, right? Um, so, really, it's in their own interest. Hold on, you're 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 lagging. Go again. So really, it's just in their own self-interest to confirm the prime minister. Yeah, ultimately, okay. right, and and that becomes more and more true as um, Putin really, you know, um, consolidated more and more power, right? That we'll see later. Okay, um, but. What we see now is that Yeltsin is laying that groundwork, right, for um, like a super presidential system on crack, which is what Putin ends up creating, right? Um, so, uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Anybody else? What about um, the Putin presidency? Speaking of which.
I thought so for the period of economic growth under Putin, he wasn't really ever specific about his goals. So any growth that they had, he was able to take credit for. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Right. Um, did they say why the growth was happening? Um, because of oil. Right. Okay. So what was, ha what was interesting is, is that, um, you know, under Yeltsin, he was still struggling with, you know, uh, you know, the growing pains of the fall of the Soviet Union and, you know, all of that. And then, um, uh, all of a sudden, right at the end, right after the economic collapse that happened in 1998, right, um, uh, and people had to, because they couldn't afford to buy um, foreign goods, they were sort of forced to buy things locally, right, and so that kind of started to spur the economy, um, and the economy started to pick up about 1999-ish, and then there was this boom in oil that happened right after that, so he was riding the coattails of a boom of local economic production that had started because people had no choice, but because they couldn't afford to buy like foreign goods. So there was this production that was happening locally that he was benefiting from. And then um, at the same time, right after that, an economic boom happened with oil, right? The price of oil just surged. So like he like literally did nothing, right? It had nothing to do with him, okay? Um, he just kind of got lucky right? Um, but he was glad to take the credit for it, right? Um, and, you know, people kind of gave him the credit for it um, because a lot of people don't know anything about it, the economy, you know. They see that he comes into office and things are just really, because that's when people started to really feel the effects were much more widespread by the time, you know, because he, um, uh, you know, he assumed the presidency, um, you know, January 1st, 2000, right? And he was elected March 2000, right? So um, the economy started to pick up around 1999, right? So it took about a year for people to feel those effects, right? So they just assume it was him, you know, he comes into office, they think, oh, he's like fixing the economy, he's like doing all this stuff. And really, it had nothing to do with him, right? Um, and so, you know, there's this period of stability, okay? But as we've seen before, all it did was, well, what do you think it did? What, what do you think it did, guys? Um, what... Well as far as the economy what do you what do we think the economy? in relation to the economy the state like all of that um i'm assuming wealth wasn't trickled down to the everyday citizen yeah for the most part i mean lives actually were improved i mean not as much as it should have been but people's lives did get better for the most part but um and in a income inequality was reduced to some degree, okay? Um, uh, you know, I mean, people did feel a difference, right? But, you know, there was still, um, you know, I mean, it wasn't like, you know, suddenly people were driving, you know, really nice cars or anything like that. But, I mean, th their, their lives were improved. Um, but what I mean really is, is that this gave Putin the excuse to not, um, go please, you're distracting me. Um, this gave Putin the excuse to not um, have to focus on things like state building. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? Okay, so he kind of like Brezhnev, right, when the economy was booming, right, he decided that he was going to use this time to really focus more on things like, you know, um, consolidating his power and regime stability, okay? Um, so, uh, you know, 
he does things like, um, uh, you know, hold on a second, my husband's walking out the door, I think, or no, my daughter just walked out the door to greet him. Um, so, uh, you know, this is why you see him doing things like, um, you know, going after the independent media, um, you know, uh, going after the oligarchs. His going after the oligarchs really didn't have to do with the state. It did in so far as he wanted to get control of like Yukos, for example, to get control of, you know, oil um, assets, right? But it wasn't necessarily for altruistic reasons for the benefit of the state, <laughs> okay? It was because he wanted to line his own pockets, right? Um, and to use some of those assets um, for uh, things like, um, you know, patronage and things like that to help, um, you know, uh, win over people that he might need, right, at a later time. Um, so, because of course, Russia is affected by the resource curves, right? So, um, oh, Lucy, yes, daddy's home. <laughs> She's getting dancy. Um, but anyway, so, uh, you know, he was focused on those types of things. He allowed the economic boom to act as a sort of cover, right, for him to, you know, make some of these moves. And he was very adept at making it look like he's doing these things for the benefit of the state right? Like I'm going after corruption with the oligarchs and I'm doing, you know, blah, 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 you know, and because Berezovsky, who was, um, Berezovsky, who was also an oligarch, right? Or the media oligarch, it looked like, oh, I'm just going after corruption, but really he was going after him for his own personal reasons. You know, um, Kojakovsky, again, the oil guy, he was going after him for his own personal reasons. It wasn't corruption, right? Um, and so, you know, that kind of thing, right? And then he consolidates the um, political parties, right? Again, it's to consolidate his power. It's to consolidate regime um, power, right? The power of the regime. Um, and what else? The only thing that he really did for state stability, like I've talked about before, was, you know, helping um, the, uh, the judicial system, right? That's pretty much it. But in a way, that was also more about regime stability, okay? Because again, if you think about, um, you know, the characteristics of the modern state and one of them being legitimacy, right? Um, that is about regime stability, right? Um, and if the average person is feeling like you know, the state is not protecting them, they're going to lose legitimacy and the regime becomes unstable. Do you know what I mean? So um, that one played double duty, right? So it did help state stability in some way, but really it was probably more to do with regime stability too. You know what I'm saying? Um, because if it was really helping state stability also, there wouldn't be this component with the judicial reforms that um, doesn't allow for, um, you know, fairness in regard to political opponents and things like that, right? So um, anyway, anyone else? Sorry, I kind of went off on a thing there. Anyone else have any thoughts? Someone besides Peter. Thank you so much, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, but anybody able to have any thoughts? I love this picture of Putin here on page 123 in the little submarine. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's, he, that's that was one of the things about him. He really did a lot to try to portray himself as this, like, strong, youthful guy, like, running around doing all these, like, manly athletic things, shirtless or in a submarine or whatever. But anyway... Anyone else have thoughts? You huh? You seen the picture on Instagram from the Washington Post of Putin today? No. Uh, he's wearing like a full mob suit. Mob? 
mop, like uh, protective equipment. Oh, 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 MOP. Yes. yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you said MOB. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's funny. Oh, gosh, I'll have to go look at that. That's funny. Um, so anyone else have any thoughts about this chapter? Um, let's see. Um, oh, we didn't even talk about the other book. Oh, well, whatever. Um, quickly, somebody tell me something from the other book. Um, I guess I'll talk. Okay. So, um, in regards to, are we talking about tandem from the Kelly book? Yeah. So I guess in regard to economics, um, Putin really stressed stability and the least disruptive approach um, for moving the economy. And he kind of wanted to focus on Russian's economic strengths like oil. But Medvedev, is that how you say his name? Medvedev. Medvedev. It's okay. You don't have to say it for it. He believed, um, it was a quote, he believed that today's good solution was tomorrow's bad answer. So he really focused on forward Russia with the efficient um, energy production, nuclear power engineering, um, space and telecommunications. Um, and he wanted a more sophisticated future and diversified economy. So I guess that's what I really focused on. Um, the right. Economics. Now, this is the thing that was really interesting about the Medvedev presidency, right? Um, and this is why it's so disappointing to me that Medvedev ended up being just as corrupt, right? Um, because he didn't start out that way, right? And he was, he was more democratic uh, than Putin. And, you know, he really seemed to want to kind of be his own man, right? Um, particularly once he got the presidency. And I think that this is one reason why Putin decided he was gonna take back the presidency in 2012, right? Because, um, you know, Medvedev was just, you know, getting a little too uppity, <laughs> you know, uh, and he didn't like some of these things that he was doing. And this being one of them, right? Medvedev was like, look, we can't, allow ourselves to be oil dependent forever. It's not going to work, right? You know, he understood concepts like the resource curse. You know, we need to be forward thinking. We need to be thinking about different ways that we can, you know, get us, you know, off the oil teat, I guess, you know, and, um, you know, work on that. And we need to do it now. You know, it's long past due. And, um, you know, uh, diversify our economy. And, you know, apparently he kind of argued with Putin about this quite a bit, right? Um, he worked on different types of reforms too in relation to, um, you know, uh, more free speech and, you know, different things like this, right? Um, and Putin just didn't like any of that, right? Uh, and so, uh, when you, so this is why, you know, initially, hi, initially when, uh, you know, Medvedev took the presidency and you started to see some of these changes, some people were kind of hopeful, if not initially kind of skeptic because Putin was prime minister, right? But you know, people were like, well, you know, Medvedev seems to be trying to, you know, put himself out there some, but it seemed like Putin kept trying to pull him back. You could sense this sort of tension. Um, but, you know, it would have been great if Medvedev could have just ruled on his own, <laughs> right? Um, but that's a really good point. Um, anybody else have any thoughts about uh, the Medvedev presidency. So, 
For the uh, 2012 election, I thought it was kind of interesting how Medvedev tried to kind of go behind Putin's back and do like a shadow campaign before he also conceded to Putin. Right. Yeah. Like he was upset, right? And naturally so, because, um, you know, there was that poll that was done uh, to see, because uh, they always do these polls. The um, uh, Ledvedev Center does, uh, oh, no, the Levada Center. I'm sorry, I'm convincing mixing Levada and Medvedev. The Levada Center does these polls all the time, you know, like, you know, how, what do you think about this person, that person, that person, whatever, right? And one just so happened to come out and it showed that Medvedev and Putin were about the same in popularity, right? But Putin's like, well, you know, I'm more popular. And that wasn't really true, right? And Medvedev wasn't very happy about that, right? Um, and a lot of people weren't. That was one of the reasons, again, for those protests. Uh, and, you know, but ultimately he was powerless to sort of stop what was happening, you know, because of uh, Putin's sort of power vertical, you know, all of these people that ultimately supported him um, and that had, that Putin had created this sort of um, patronage system around, you know, that a lot of people owed him favors and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it is what it is. I have a question. Yeah. So there's like a part of the chapter, I think it's under the governing the nation in tandem, where it talks about like, without hindsight, Richard Sakwa argued there's two ways forward for the new president to assert his authority. He talked about like conventional and change the nature of the tandem, but they said that there was like a third, like different way that happened. And I guess I was just, they, they had kind of formatted it weird. I didn't know how that like differed from the two ways he described. Oh, hold on a second. You mean the different elements? Um, I don't know. Let me try to find the page. I'm looking at my, I don't know. It's on 170. Is it 168? Yeah, 168 to 172. So their strategies first was very conventional. Medvedev was advocate his own supporters into positions of increasing power within the presidential administration and the government. There was like, okay, and then it was like change the nature of the tandem in a description. Hold on. Yeah, it's um, wait, governing the nation in tandem. I think it's that's what I have for my notes. Hold Actually, on. let me. Try, I'm gonna try to find it. What page did you say it was again? I don't know. Is it uh, 168? 168. Oh yeah, it was like the first is very conventional. The second, right, and then the my, and then there was like the third. The third was like what really happened? It was well-meaning but largely unsuccessful attempt to deal with the inordinately visible corruption in all levels of political and commercial life. Uh huh. The thing of political identity does it for some level of respect for the state. Uh, mm Yeah, um, so I guess what they were talking about um, there was that, um, because it, if you remember, um, you may remember that he was, um, his background is in law, right? So like he has like a PhD or something in law, 
Okay. And so for him, this one was particularly important, right? He had set out, like he wanted to work on these issues of corruption, which is kind of ironic because like we see how cor vastly corrupt he is now, right? Um, and so it's really, that's one reason why it was really depressing for me to see the vastness and, you know, level of his corruption, right? Because he didn't start off that way. He um, really seemed to um, be very uncomfortable with it as prime minister, right? And, you know, definitely seemed to be making a concerted effort through his presidency um, to try and curtail uh, these different efforts of, um, you know, of, of corruption from, you know, the bottom up, but again, because of Putin's power vertical with, you know, all the various levels of patronage and all this stuff, like it, it just seemed like there was nothing he could do, whether it was, you know, in various court systems and, you know, um, just everyday life or anything like that. It was like he, it seemed like he was just spitting into the wind, <laughs> right? Um, and he seemed to be able to not make any kind of headway there. Whereas these types of things, Putin not only um, was willing to look the other way, he actually encouraged, right? And so um, that was just something that was, uh, you know, allegedly just very difficult uh, for him. And it seems that he ultimately just sort of gave way to and it almost makes you know like i kind of wonder about this honestly um like i mean i don't know like i i wonder because you know i mean just thinking about to like his early days and you know the various things that that you know about him like if you've ever read anything about him like, I just wonder, like, I mean, I know that power corrupts, right? But it's like, what happened <laughs> to him? You know, like, how did, how did that happen? Um, and it's really depressing. You know, like that video I showed you guys with the ducks and his little, you know, mansion with the duck house and all that kind of stuff and that vast property that he has. You know, of course, it looks like a shanty compared to Putin's palace, right? Um, but, you know, it's just unbelievable. Um, and I wonder if, you know, Putin somehow got, I don't know, I wonder how Putin got, got to him or what happened or if he just buckled and was like, everybody's doing it, I guess. I'll get mine, you know? I mean, what happened? I, I just don't know. I feel like when all of his predecessors have done, like, very similar acts of, like, you know, corruption involving, like, privatization of, like, state funds and stuff like that, I feel like it's definitely, you know, it's just a sign of the times. Like, right. it's bound to happen to everyone that leads, you know? Yeah, but, like, you know, it's like, um, like Alexei Navalny was talking about in that video, right? that like, look, this is Angela Merkel's house. This is Bill Clinton's house, right? <laughs> and then here's, you know, um, Dmitry Medvedev's house, <laughs> right? And that's just one of his properties, right? This doesn't include his other properties like in Italy and other places, right? Um, Kind of makes me wonder if, because both Medvedev and Putin, they studied under the same professor at university, right. if they were like taught how to circumvent the system even worse than it already was. I don't know, May, you know, that's a, that's a good question, you know, but I know that Medvedev was very much like into democracy. He was very much a believer in democratic reform he was, you know, very serious about like the rule of law and all that kind of stuff, like early on. So, you know, like he was like really 
the more like academic between he and Putin, you know? So it, from, from that regard, like doing things by the book like that, right? Um, I don't know, you know, it's, it's difficult to know what, what goes on in people's minds, you know? But anyway, all right, so next time we'll um, go on, we're gonna try to like kind of hurry up to kind of catch up a little bit. So next time we're gonna do, try to do all of, um, uh, you know, seven, and then um, for next Tuesday, we'll do like maybe all of eight, and then we'll just try to kind of catch up a little bit as best we can okay okay all right guys so talk to you later thank, right, you. thank you no problem bye bye, bye. bye.